Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Startup Savant Podcast. I'm your host, Ethan, and this show is about the stories, challenges, and triumphs of fast-scaling startups and the founders who run them. Our guest on the show today is Ken Amit. Ken is the founder and CEO of Tapalti, a global fintech company that aims to create a modern, holistic, and powerful payable solution that scales with your changing business needs. Tapalti was started in 2010 for small and mid-sized companies who simply did not have the financial management tools of larger enterprises for making overseas transactions. To give you an idea of the scale of the company now, in 2021, Tapalti automated more than $36 billion across 200 countries, and he's used by big names such as Twitter, Canva, and Twitch. And I'm really excited to get into this conversation with Ken. But before I do that, I want to remind you that Startup Savant is on a mission to get 100 reviews by episode 100. So if you're enjoying the show, you can help us reach our goal simply by heading over to Apple Podcasts on your iPhone or desktop and leaving a rating. It just takes a minute or two and it really helps us out. All right, let's get into what we all came here for today, a chat with Ken Amit. Ken, how's the day treating you so far? Looking good, sunny outside here, gorgeous day, so enjoying it so far. Awesome. I'm stoked you're having a good day. We are going to get right into it. Could you tell us a little bit more detail on what Tipalti is? So Tipalti automates financial operations for high growth and mid-market companies. That would be companies, let's say, up to around a thousand, maybe a few thousand employees. And what's challenging with these uh, finance leaders in these companies is that they already know the complexities of running a a successful uh, finance function. They know what great execution looks like. But in these, you know, 200, 400, 500 person companies, a thousand even, resources go towards everything but the back office, everything but Uh, managing suppliers. It's all about the product, the growth, the market, the go-to-market, the brand, the employees, the partners, everything but. So you're left with a finance leader that has relatively complex needs, but low ability to execute. And therefore, when you solve for the needs of those finance leaders, you need to solve for the many functions that make finance operations. In our case, it's everything from supplier onboarding, supplier vetting, uh, uh, procurement, invoice processing, PO matching, currency management, uh, reconciliation, expense management, uh, credit card management, just very broad set of challenges. You have to manage to do all of that, but it's not just scratching the surface. The product needs to have a certain depth because these companies already start having a level of complexity. So you need the breadth, you need the depth. Usually breadth and depth comes with long implementation and uh, an integrator and a couple of years and uh, many hundreds of thousands of, of spend. This is not available for our customers. You need breadth, depth, and simplicity all in one package. And that's what uh, makes us unique. We do have that breadth. We've started in 2010 and have created the depth over the years and have made it very simple. And I think uh, we're gaining the success we do uh, thanks to that. So you mentioned you started in 2010. Um, Obviously, this is a much different company than it was back then. Um, You've got hundreds, if not thousands of employees. I have it written down here somewhere, but uh, I'm not going to try to reference it. Um, Can you tell us what the initial problem that Tapalti was trying to solve was? Back in 2010, what was your what was your first goal to solve the problem for a user? Yeah, so uh, just bef- before Tipalti, I sold and I, I was the CEO of another company and sold it uh, right before the 2008 crash. Tried to do some of my own initiatives, got bored with uh, not, not finding anything that was worth investing my time. Reached out to a friend, uh, my co-founder in Tipalti, Oren Ziv, and asked him if he sees anything interesting from his portfolio or um, or deal generation, uh, deal flow, uh, let me know. And a few months later, he calls me and one of his portfolio companies, an online ad network called Infolinks, the founder of that company was complaining about the challenges of paying publishers around the world. Um, So we met, uh, or myself and, and that founder met in a coffee shop here in Tel Aviv. 
and he described the problem. At first, the problem looked too basic, like paying people around the world in 2010. Isn't that solved like whatever uh, ages ago? Uh, so I wasn't sure that there is a real problem. I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm bored enough. Let me find the right solution that already exists out there and, and uh, just uh, help this guy. Uh, so I, I sat with him. I shadowed him for a couple of days, uh, seeing what, what exactly the problem uh, he was having. It was more than payments. It was actually much broader than that. It was about onboarding those publishers that came from yeah, many countries around the world, and one wanted to get paid with PayPal, one wanted to get paid with Wire, and the regulator in that country wanted this piece of information, the regulator in that country wanted that piece of information, and the bank rejected the payment because of this, and uh, and the tax form was not, you know, just a mess. It was really a messy process. So I understood the problem and said, okay, uh, and, and then I met another founder, a CFO founder of another company who said, yeah, I share the same problem, another ad network. Um, but then I met another dozen other CFOs who told me the opposite, not interesting, don't touch it, no problem, I solved it, you know, nothing for you to do here. So I was kind of stuck with two people who were saying, please solve it for us. And then a dozen saying, don't build a company around it. And not coming from the field, I wasn't sure what to do. I knew that if I wanted, Oren wanted to invest, my co-founder wanted to invest in the company, but I knew that taking money, like a proper VC money comes with an obligation to, you know, sign up for high growth and, you know, funding and building and all of that. I wasn't sure that that's, that problem deserved that treatment. And I thought maybe it's just a project for these two people to Israeli ad networks. Maybe it's just a problem of Israeli, a couple of Israeli ad networks. So I set out to do it myself. I, I was just, uh, I decided I'll build it. I was a programmer in past life. I haven't programmed for 17 years uh, at that time in 2010. Wow. So the last time, yeah, I, I was uh, actually programming was 17 years earlier, but I really liked programming. I said, you know what? Uh, that'll be an interesting. Let's do that. I'll build a product for or solution or or whatever for these two companies and see how that works. Uh, and that that's what I did for the first year. By the end of the year, I had four customers. I had some interesting experiences that showed me that we're onto something. Um, and yeah, for the first year, I was the developer. I was the integrator. I was the support, the marketing, the sales. Created the website. You know, there was a a phone number that you could call and you pressed one for sales, two for marketing, three for support. It all went to me. Uh, so, you know, I did what I had to do at the time. And after a year, I figured that, yeah, there's something here. And uh, I, I like to say that I doubled the company and went global. I added one more person and hired him in Los Angeles. So <laughs> achieved both milestones uh, to help me see if there's a need in uh, North America as well. And shortly after he joined, we started signing up uh, customers in the US and sorry. So you had two people that said, hey, this is a problem, I'd like you to solve it for me. And 12 that said, you know what, this isn't a problem, we've got it figured out. What was the, what was the push that made you move forward with building this company? Or did it, or did you know that you were going to solve this problem, but if you thought that more people would have signed up, you would have put more human power behind it than maybe just yourself. Uh, if, if I've seen, if there was more traction uh, when I was uh, evaluating the, the problem, if there is a real problem here, if there was more traction, I would have uh, got, you know, taken funding or and wanted to fund it uh, and, 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 you know, started hiring and building a company. Uh, but I wasn't sure. I th there was an, an alternative that was attractive to me which was to build a solution for maybe to maybe a handful of customers and just be a one man show and and be done with it and just do that and have a little business for myself that was an attractive proposition for me i was happy with that proposition and i didn't want to uh, tarnish it with a uh, some likelihood that it's not startup a uh, vc funding 
a viable company. So sure. there was a, a question mark here and there was something attractive there. So I decided to go with the option that uh, I'll start it myself and see where it, where it, uh, how it develops. Um, that was the reason. So I know this question might be asking you to kind of like speculate in the rear view mirror, but do you think that that first year, those first, you know, couple of years before you took funding, before you started to bring on a large team, what do you think the differences in the company that you own now are compared to if you were to have started your company with a larger team, with VC funds, what differences do you think would be between those two decisions? There were many points, you know, it's, it's, um, I am kind of a person who likes to self doubt myself and look back and, and question the decisions I've made. Uh, and Oren is the opposite. Oren just, no, no, you know, we did, that was the right, that was the right decision, you know, move back in time. We'll do the same decision again. And I think he's right. Uh, but, but to your specific question, I think, um, that this company started in, you know, in a slow cooking mode. We kind of, uh, slowly, uh, built more and more, understood more and more what the problem was, tackled big, uh, complex problems. And there is a benefit. Um, I think the difference between a person, one person company and a 10 person company, there is, there's, Debate, you know, it's debatable whether a 10 person company moves faster than a one person company. It's not to some extent. Uh, so I was able to move fast to learn a lot. Um, how would the company, uh, have looked? I think we gained a lot by this slow cooking mode. Um, yeah, it's a hard question to answer. I'm not sure. Do you feel like you retained more personal ownership? and um not just ownership you know on paper but uh but leadership the the control of the company because you went those first couple of years without taking funds both both a uh, actual shareholding i think because we moved uh, slowly and were able to accumulate uh, material assets like uh, both in terms of the product and the customer base by the end of the second year we had probably two dozen customers and, you know, it was a meaningful business and we're processing meaningful, meaningful amounts of money and doing that with a bare bones a team. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm still a major shareholder in the company uh, 12 years later. And I think that's that's part of it. But definitely the, the fact that I was the developer and the integrator and working with the banks and working with the customers and doing implementations and the sales and the sales calls and, you know, doing the booths in events and all the conferences and all of that, that created, a, that allows me to be very knowledgeable in everything in the company until today. And um, in my leadership style, it comes from content, right? It's not like a big personality type that uh, rah rahs around the corridors. Uh, I, I come with the knowledge and, and uh, with the experience that helped me a ton uh, leading the company until this day. All right, I want to talk about um, I want to talk about risk taking um, and something that interesting came up when we were doing research, uh, and that was between entrepreneurial gigs. Um, I'm going to quote there: between entrepreneurial gigs, you played poker to make a modest living. <laughs> Can you tell us a little about, about this poker per career? Yeah. Um, so there were two, two periods of poker. Um, the one you're referring to. So I just got into poker uh, earlier, uh, in, in, I forget exactly what year, but between these two periods, 2008 and 2010, uh, I decided to pl to play poker. I call it professionally, semi-professionally. Like it was making a living. I couldn't sustain myself uh, with that living only. Um, I have friends who are now professional poker players. I believe I could have become a professional poker player. I think my career is better, and I uh, poker is a hard way to make easy living. They say. Um, so yeah, I, I, I loved poker. I love the 
a multifaceted aspects of poker. There's psychology, there's logic, there's reading the room, there's uh, statistics, there's um, guts. There's a lot going into poker that, by the way, there, there's some analogies in business life as well of just, you know, reading your cards properly and playing uh, and reading the other players' cards, even without seeing them, understanding the other players' cards, making sure that you do not play the stance that they play in front of you, but you actually play the cards. This is really important. It actually happened to me in life where um, I had to do that. And in, in you know, in tough negotiations, uh, I called the bluff on, on some people a few times. Um, so yeah, that was a fun, a fun period of time. But uh, when, when uh, Tipalti drew me, it sucked me all in and that was all, all that I was doing. So you 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 jumped into my next question there on I was going to ask you what skills transferred from your poker game as you to your role as a startup founder and you you knocked it out. Do you feel like there's one skill that if somebody could say, okay, I play poker, I'm good at poker, of all of the skills that they have to learn, what's the one that you think translates to being a startup founder the most? I'll give you two answers, one directly and one and important for, for poker players and for founders as well, I think. Yeah, the one that translates the best is uh, during negotiations, uh, just playing uh, your cards correctly, not overplaying, not underplaying, not going all in when you don't have a, a good story behind behind going all in. Um, and, and not, uh, not being, uh, bluffed easily, uh, by a bluffer that doesn't have a good story behind their, their, uh, the way they play the cards. So play your cards, read your, your party, your, your counterparty. Uh, poker is a zero sum game. So usually in business, uh, you don't go into zero sum game situations, but in the few events that you do, uh, that's important. The other skill that is really important in poker is called bankroll management. It's just making sure that you place bets within um, your ability to absorb losses. Like you will, the randomness of poker and the randomness or volatility in poker and volatility in life, right? Um, will throw, will throw a pair of balls at you. And uh, if you didn't play your bankroll correctly, you will go bust and you won't be able to continue in the game. I think in the current environment where, you know, every year you have one in a decade uh, event, right? Or one in a hundred years event, you have COVID, it's one in a, in a hundred years event. And then you have a war in, in Russia, it's one in a decade maybe. And then there's a recession, which is one in a decade as well. And every year there's one in a decade, maybe at least one or two, one in the banking industry collapse, collapse in the banking industry. So I think you need to be ready for the, um, for this, uh, never heard of before events. And you need to bankroll for these never heard of events and, be able to absorb the hits and recover from them and continue. Yeah, I think it's smart to plan for something. It's it's hard to know what because the chances of any one of those specific things happening is very low, but the chances of something happening, whether it's any of those or something else, is always you know, on the horizon. Almost so guaranteed. By now, yeah. after the, the, the several years we've been through, it's almost guaranteed that something some curveball will be thrown at you in the next, whatever, 12 months. So when something like this comes up on your plate and you feel like you need to make a decision, um, whether it's you know a, a medium or high stakes business decision, is there some sort of framework that you feel like you fall back to in order to make those decisions? I think that naturally in crisis mode, I get the most relaxed and I get the most concentrated and kind of uh, go back to basics and I'm able to open, like uh, there's a, a, a story when, when my CFO joined us uh, just over four years ago, uh, one of the first events uh, was an offsite that the executive team held. Uh, and uh, during that offsite, uh, we had some data breach or suspected data breach. 
And we kind of all paused and said, okay, let's pull the disaster recovery manual. And how do you do that? And let's, it was all very calm. And, and a few hours in, she said, you know what? I thought, I thought it was a, a, a practice run. I didn't believe that. I, I thought you were just practicing disaster recovery and forgot to tell me, but if this is how you manage disasters, then yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all in with this team. And, um, yeah, I think we go to basics. We, you will get your, your, your crisis, you know, once in a couple of years that you need to handle. You go to basics, you evaluate it properly. The critical aspect is just acting very, very fast. I think what we've been good at is identifying the, the reality quickly and acting very quickly. I think that's the critical aspect is not skipping the denial phase as, as much as possible or going through denial very quickly and then moving on to accepting the new reality and acting with the new reality as, as, as much as it hurts you, as much as it disrupts your dreams, your aspirations, what you were planning for the year, just accept the new reality and act quickly. I think that's the key, the key to, um, um, you know, going through those uh, uh, successfully. I feel like you're kind of giving me a buffet of directions that I could go in here. Um, so first off, thank you for that. You're making my job real easy. Um, I want to talk about speed for just a second since you brought it up. This seems like in multiple different places that I that I read when again, when we were doing research for this, I kept finding speed and agility as something that you personally talk about. What do you find that speed is the most important thing in startup culture, or do you think that it is secondary to something else? Good question. You know, I started and said we're slow cooking in the beginning, so that's the counter to speed, right? So I, I, re <laughs> I really appreciated the first few years where we were not uh, in a hurry up mode. And I think it was, again, it's about objectively assessing the situation and making clear headed objective decisions. No one was chasing us. We had a great idea. We were working on it. We we're developing it. The risk of someone eating our lunch was low at the time. And uh, we had the luxury. So uh, we used that and we used that to our advantage that, that we are benefiting from uh, today. Um, and in, in that period of time, we also took some really critical strategic decisions that we took them intentionally in a slow pace. So in 2012, uh, Oren and myself uh, had a discussion about whether we need to become a, a licensed uh, entity, a licensed money transmitter. It's not, not uh, the same scrutiny of banks, but it's a tier below banks. It's really disruptive. It's really costly. And there were strategically important reasons to do that. Nothing tactically, nothing immediate, all long-term strategy. So we, we started with that, but took it uh, in a paced uh, mode until crisis hit. At, at some sometime uh, late in 2013, a certain crisis hit, and then uh, we moved, and, and that's an example of when you need to move uh, very quickly. We, we stopped everything in the company. We, everyone was focused on that crisis for the next nine months. It was moving ourselves from a non-licensed mode to a licensed mode. It was a, a defining moment for the company. And, and we're able to do that in COVID. Uh, we, we took action very, very early. And I think it will, both to, to close shop, but, and, and stop hiring and just, you know, pause for a moment. But we also went back to hiring and growing very quickly. So um, I think it depends. Sometimes you need to move very fast. And sometimes you need to move uh, at pace uh, or, or, you know, in, in, in a, a paced way. Uh, it depends on the situation, on, on, on um, yeah, it's a situation. All right. So there were a ton of startups formed in 2010. And today, I mean, statistically, just so many of them no longer exist. And some of the ones that are still around are, you know, great companies making respectable numbers and employing lots of people. But some 
of these startups became, you know, big. They they scaled. They figured out something that's allowed them to grow exponentially. And Tapalti is clearly one of these companies. So tell me why. What what was it that made Tapalti so different from the rest of the companies that were formed around the same time that didn't have the same outcomes? So it's hard for me to compare, like I need examples of those startups to really compare. I can tell you what worked well for us uh, throughout the years. Um, so first, uh, we hit product market fit from the get-go. There's a, a big, a big caveat there, but uh, when we launched and the product we launched is pretty much the same product uh, uh, or part of the same product or one of the products we offer today, and it, it had a great product market fit. The reason we were able to, I think one of the critical reasons for being able to reach product market fit very cleanly uh, was because I knew nothing about payments and nothing about online advertising, which was the first few customers, were the first few customers. I knew nothing about banking, money transmission, regulation. I was a clean slate. I came from a completely different domain telecommunications and the information security and, and business intelligence. Um, so when I solved the problem, I really uh, sat with these few, you know, couple of leaders and listened to them and formed what I believed was the right answer for the problems they presented to me. It gets tricky because when I presented the solution to a, one of those, that, that company Infolinks, the head of engineering there told me, oh, we won't accept that version of like the, the way you want the product to be is not, I, I, I recommend highly against it. It's not how it will work. It's not a good way to work. And when I analyzed what he told me, I understood that if I followed his advice, um, it'll become a way more complex for customers to use the product. He came from an engineering uh, perspective and kind of, um, uh, you know, I, I haven't programmed for 17 years, so I wasn't up to speed with the best and brightest of, of uh, development. And he wanted to use, you know, the, the most sophisticated and advanced technologies, which were not a good fit for, for what we did. Uh, so, I, and, and that's also something that you need to learn. Sometimes you need to say no to your customers. And even if it was before the launch of version number 0 0.1, right? It was pre-launch and you're one of the two customers you're engaging with saying, no, don't do that this way. You need to do it another way. Sometimes you need to follow your logic. You need to follow your analysis. You need to follow your guts. And that's what I did there. And, and again, it serves us until this day and uh, having, a, um, having the personal backbone the product backbone, just, you know, have a clear strategy, a clear vision of what you're trying to achieve, uh, served us and, and, um, and led us in this journey. Um, again, I gave the example of, of that critical uh, time in 2012 for applying the licenses, having a clear strategy again, uh, served us well. And then the next pivot, uh, mo pivotal moment was when one of our customers it told us, you know, you're doing all this great job helping me pay thousands of publishers around the world. Uh, but then I, when I pay my groceries and my rent and for buying laptops, I spend half a day, spend 15 minutes paying thousands of publishers and half a day paying a couple dozen others. Can you do your magic on, on those? <laughs> that was in 2013, 14. Um, so we started with that. We started, uh, with, with, uh, uh, embarking on what is now our accounts payable solution, which is the, the largest part of our addressable market is now classical accounts payable. The, the ad network business is about a third and, and the classical accounts payable is two thirds. And then we've expand, expanded from there. So, um, you need to know when to listen to customers and when not to listen to customers, when to push back and when to stand on your grounds. And, uh, it's a tricky game. So as you're growing through a company and you're going through time and you are growing through growth, obviously you, you, you are, you know, 
changing your products over time, you're matching things. How do you how do you balance as the leader of a company? How do you balance keeping your head down and being focused on what you're doing while also keeping your head up and understanding what's on the horizon and how to be proactive when you need to be proactive and reactive in situations where you need to be reactive? Um, you know, I, I, I understand what I'm better at and what I'm not uh, uh, the best person in, in the team. By now, I'm probably not the best, best at anything in, in the team, but uh, there, are, there are areas where I know there are others who have done more and know more than I do. I can add a lot of value to them, but uh, I need uh, help. And areas where I know not only am I good at, but also I like to uh, focus my time on. So obviously strategy and vision and culture are, are now critical aspects and, you know, policy in the company are critical aspects at the size we are at. Um, but I always knew that, uh, or not only knew, I was blessed with uh, marketing leaders and sales leaders, which were way more capable than I was in those domains. And I gave them a lot of latitude and, and that played uh, great for me. So the president of Tipalti is, um, was hired as the chief marketing officer out of NetSuite um, eight years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And he's been with me uh, for that period of time. And he's the best B2B marketeer on the planet. So I was blessed, uh, you know, he would consult with me mostly on branding and positioning and messaging and things that kind of that the, um, you know, my gut, uh, understanding the product from my gut helps refine, but he drives uh, that machine and uh, uh, the sales leaders that, the sales leader that I have has, has built organizations. Uh, I've never, I've ne never done that. And it's a complex and demanding task. So I'd naturally uh, always lean towards the, the product and engineering and vision, uh, product vision. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it was natural for me. So you obviously lean on your, on your leadership team, uh, especially in the air, in the areas where you aren't the, the world's number one expert. Do you have any general advice on not just creating a high quality leadership team with a players, but creating the right leadership team? Um, I think that the leadership team that that uh, we've created in Tipalti just shares the core, core, core values, and uh, that um, in a way it's a diverse team, but but very similar at the same time. So we're all I like to call it simple to work with. You know, no big egos, no big personalities. And no one, no, we don't uh, think of ourselves too much. Uh, and it helps in the interaction a lot. Very execution oriented. So we're all with a tendency to move forward and to drive forward. And uh, it helps that. And, and then we're very analytical. The three together creates a very collaborative team because, you know, you don't have the ego. So obviously you'll want to help the other person and you want to move forward. You know that they will help you. And, so on and so forth. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, paying attention to the the values that these people come with, and how they will fit you yourself as a leader and the rest of the team, and correcting when you make a mistake. I've made my share of mistakes in hiring as well. And again, that's example where you need to act very quickly. If you identify that you made a mistake, it's painful. You've spent so. For me, every hire of the exec team takes. At least six months. You spend six months or nine months hiring a person only to learn that you know it's not really what what you thought you were you were signing up for. So correct it quickly. It's not in the it's in the best interest of the company and of the other person not to drag it and to correct quickly and to pay the price for you know accept the price of the mistake and just correct it and and yeah. So these are the two uh, two things to focus on. It sounds like you you have a lot of confidence in your ability to lead 
Um, and I'm assuming that that is, that has, you've probably also always had some of that confidence, but I'm assuming that more has been built over, over time. What do you feel like the, the kind of evolutions are that you've gone through as a leader, not necessarily just within Topalti, but with the company or companies before Topalti, what do you feel like the leveling up that you have done has been? Yeah, so I was a, a fairly senior manager at a very young age, and I was not trained for that uh, function. So I, I was absolutely out of my skis uh, in the early parts of my career. <laughs> and the part uh, that was missing was what we just discussed, just, you know, really refining how you hire well, how you retain well, and how you fire well. It's the, the muscle that I just was never um, uh, in, in that early part of the career in the 1990s that I, I never, it wasn't, it was a company that, that wasn't just never fired anyone. So it was just unnatural to do that. And I had the situation where I needed to fire someone and I didn't. And, you know, it hurts me until this day to think about that situation. It was better for both of us if I had and I didn't. Um, um, so, yeah, you, you develop muscles. Ideally, you get trained. Like we try to train our managers in all the ma basic and more than basic uh, skills of management. Uh, I lacked some of it. I was uh, educated in business school, but, but you know, real life is, is different than business school. Uh, so that was one part. Um, yeah, I think I, I was a pro, you know, good in, at the uh, product strategy and, and vision, uh, f you know, from early in my career. Um, having more, yeah, the, uh, the next uh, education came in later in my career uh, when I understood that I made mistakes uh, with investors. So one thing is hiring um a leadership, you know, C-level uh, leaders. The other is when you sign up with investors or, or when you get married with investors, so to speak, you cannot get divorced from investors. It's very hard. No, no, it's not impossible. I actually learned of someone who was able to fire an investor, force them to sell, but that's a very, very, uh, you, you know, uh, problematic situation. And throughout Tipalti, we've said no several times brand name, big name investors. There's actually a case study that my business school INSEAD did on that exactly on one event in 2017 that we walked away, not from a term sheet, we walked away from a signing of a definitive agreement that was like, you know, life changing for the company because we found out that the investor was not what we thought it would be, it would be, and we walked away. So I think these are, um, yeah. Um, it, and then the last piece that I think I learned later in my career is just the importance of um, company culture and company values that they really matter. It was something that took me a while to understand the real importance of company culture and that it, it's there, it's real, it exists. Uh, so yeah, Managing your executive team, hiring, uh, promoting, retaining, but if you need to uh, also firing, uh, managing investors, really critical, really, really critical. It's not natural. It's hard. Sometimes you have to say no when you don't have many alternatives. And then uh, just the importance at, at our scale, we're about, we're a thousand employees at our scale. Culture means a lot. It's real. You need to hire for the culture, you need to promote for the culture, you need to celebrate the culture, you need to make sure that the culture is alive and kicking. And um, yeah, these are some of the developments I've gone through. So going back to that funding, um, I know you've got a ton of experience with it. I mean, the last the last round you all raised was your Series F, um, which is much further along in the alphabet than, uh, than most of the conversations that I have. Um, what if you don't, if you could share that investor that you walked away from, that it just wasn't right, what was it, a, what was it about it and what kind of tipped you off to the fact that this wasn't right and it wasn't going to be a good decision? 
Yeah, so uh, I hope we, it's uh, I hope we have the time to to describe the situation. It was 2017. We went out to the market to fundraise. We got three term sheets, and at the same time, we got an acquisition proposal. And I was I was generally against uh, M and A or being bought, uh, but one of the investors. Um, Said, you know, it's 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 too good to be, like it. You need to explore it at least. I went and explored it, and after a few months, decided to walk away. It wasn't a good fit. Went back to these three term sheets, and I had to choose one. And and we chose Orin and myself. We chose a, pe- a person that actually felt right for us. Of the three term sheets, he actually felt the most uh, compatible with the company. A few months into and now. There was a, immediately after the day after signing the term sheet, the first red flag was raised. It was technical. He wanted something that you should have not only you should have asked before the term sheet, but I asked him explicitly and Orrin asked him explicitly, "Are you clear with that? Is it only legal and, and financial due diligence?" He said yes. And the day after, he said, "Oh, I need more business due diligence," which was hmm. kind of disappointing. But we are, you know, uh, one of the metrics we haven't discussed it, but one of the metrics in the company is one percent. Gross annual churn. Customers stay with us forever, so they love us. Yeah, of course, speak with customers, whoever you want. So it didn't it didn't matter to me. But about uh, I think a month or, or six weeks into the process of uh, the definitive agreement, uh, I got two calls from people who care about me and said, "We've heard that you're in uh, working uh, or fundraising from this investor. Be careful. He has a reputation." Uh, I spoke with Oren. Uh, Oren said, so you know what, it's, we really need the money. Maybe, maybe it's not that bad. Let's evaluate it or something. Then he got a couple of calls as well. And, and then we decided to confront the investor and tell him what we've heard. And, um, long story short, we said, you know what, we'll craft the agreement in a way that protects us. Let's have an agreement that is very restrictive and hopefully is a great partner, but but if not, we'll have the agreement that protects us. And the investor agreed, and we moved on. And then, really, the last moment of the day of signing the definitive agreement, um, there was a small uh, thing I wanted to change. Uh, there was a two closes. There was a first close, immediate, and then a second close. And the second close was 30 days out, and it was a very complex year for me. I didn't want to go directly to, to raising the, the second close or working on the second close. I asked to extend it to 60 days. Who cares? 30 days first close, 60 days first close. I asked my lawyer and he said, uh, asked him if I need approval from the investor. Say, you know, technically you don't need to, but it's common uh, practice. You know, it'll be the right thing to do. So do that. And then I said, you know what? It's actually a good opportunity. Let's do that. Let's ask him and see how he responds. If, if his reputation that we've learned of um, will show up somehow in that. I spoke to Oren. Oren said, come on, it's, it's too easy. Like no one fails this test. If he fails this test, then it's done. Of course, uh, I, I asked the investor, you know, I want to extend the second close from 30 days to 60 days. And he blew up. He became very aggressive, uh, um, you know, completely inappropriate, uh, inappropriate language, just all all around unacceptable. And we decided to walk away. I have to credit wow. Oren that provided me with a backup because uh, we changed our plans. We didn't raise as much as we wanted. We didn't. There were some changes to the plan, but the changes were worth it to avoid these investors. This was actually. The final red lines. We were ready to sign and walked away. At the time, it was a huge round for us. It was a $30 million. The previous round was, I think, eight. So it was a major, major round. We were also yeah. running on fumes because it was that year with everything that happened in the year. So, yeah, it was uh, one of those defining moments in the life of the company. Thank you for sharing that. I know that you know, situations like that are, are definitely not easy and they're, and they're not always the easiest to share. Um, quick question on that. Do you feel like if this was your first round, if this was, you know, your round a, do you feel like you would have had to have gone through with this or, or was this just a situation where this just was not going to happen no matter what? No, I think, 
I, yeah, I think I would have taken the money uh, not knowing what I knew because in life, um, you know, at a, at a certain point in, in uh, my career, I took a company um, relatively late and sold it. Like I, I didn't contribute to the company much, but sold it, that company that I sold in 2008, I was there for a very short time, but investors had a full, uh, you know, lo- uh, let's say that I've seen investors uh, not uh, perform ideally. And that experience was important for this decision. Now, earlier in my career, uh, I probably, or uh, there's highly likely that I, I would not have even considered you know, making this test and, and trying the investor or anything like that. Or maybe if you pushed back hard, maybe I would have said, you know what? Okay, let's do 30 days. No, no matter. Yeah, I'll do that. But uh, yeah, I think it took it took the experience that I've had and the experience working with investors and and again uh, understanding really what's behind his behavior um, that was critical for me to make the decision. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's an extremely extremely valuable story, and I know that our listeners are going to really appreciate hearing that. Um, all right, let's move on. Is there anything? Uh, is there anything that's going on with Tipalti over this next year that you'd like to uh, that you'd like to announce or anything like that? So Tipalti is uh, is blessed in in that we are not experiencing the recession as much as we hear others are experiencing. So you know, I like to rely on metrics, and the two metrics that I think tell the story are one. Sales cycles not prolonging. We've we've had the same uh, relatively short sales cycles from before the recession, through the recession, through price increases, and uh, we're seeing very uh, hard demand for the products. When we uh, we are in front of a prospect, uh, they see the value and they sign up for it. And the same is true for retention. Uh, the same retention before the the recession start or the, the economical condition uh, changed and and through now. So in that sense, we're blessed. Uh, we've we've added uh, some important capabilities last year. We're adding important capabilities this year. The SVB, um, uh, you know, developments um, expose some of the value of Tipalti being. You know, we run on top of Citibank, JP Morgan Chase, and Wells Fargo. So mm-hmm. I think our customers really benefit from that. And we saw some influx of customers who uh, ran away from uncertainty uh, to Tipalti. So yeah, we're continuing with our vision. The vision is to provide this broad, holistic, uh, breadth, depth, and simplicity for uh, our customers. You'll see more announcements, some major announcements throughout the year, but too early to announce them right now. All right. Well, we'll just keep our eyes open for those uh, for those big things. All right. Moving into my absolute favorite question: What is your number one piece of advice for early stage entrepreneurs? Number one advice for early stage entrepreneurs. Yeah, I think you need to be selective to selectively listen to customers. You need to listen to customers. There's a ton of value that these first two customers provided me a ton. They they crafted both parts of the product and parts of the legal agreements and other other aspects of the business that were critical for me. But they also, uh, some of the advice was not uh, the correct advice. So have your own backbone. Don't take everything a customer says at face value. They don't know what you know. No one will ever be as an expert in the product as you will be. Uh, so yeah, have, have the product backbone. I think product market fit is, is the cornerstone of a, any success. It's good to take you a long, long, long while. Eventually you need more than just product market fit, but uh, if you haven't reached critical, clear, strong product market fit, continue to iterate until you do, because that's the, a basic infrastructure for any success. All right, excellent advice. And I know we went deep on some of that earlier in this episode. So folks, go back and listen again because it's all right there. Ken, last question, where can people connect with you online and how can our listeners support Tipalti? 
Uh, you can connect me through on, on LinkedIn, of course. So look for Chen Amit and I'm a Tipalti, so it's easy enough to find me. Uh, how you can uh, support Tipalti? So uh, the market, we are in a very nascent market. We're still in the fa phase of uh, market education. If you are uh, in a company that's within that range of, you know, 50 employees to a thousand employees, and we can be of value to you, uh, please reach out. Or if you know friends who can be of, uh, uh, we can be of value to please reach out. And um, yeah, appreciate uh, appreciate all those who do. All right, Hen, this has been awesome. Seriously, seriously good advice and really great stories. I'm so glad that we had you on. Um, and folks, you can find all of everything we talked about today, all the links, the LinkedIn, all that good stuff over at the show notes. Those are going to be at startupsavant.com slash podcast. And Hint, is there anything you'd like to say to uh, sign us out? I really appreciate the time. It was uh, fascinating for me to, to be part of that. Excellent questions. And I love those. And thank you so much for having me here. All right, that's gonna be it for this week's episode of the Startup Savant Podcast. Thanks for hanging out. Hey, we hear that video is the next big thing, and that's why we've put all of our full-length interviews on our YouTube channel. So if you're a fan of video, go check that out. Just open up the YouTube app and type Startup Savant Podcast in the search bar. That is where you will find us. Next Wednesday morning, that's when you're gonna hear from us next, and I can't wait to hang out again. But until then, go and build something beautiful. The Startup Savant Podcast is produced by Truick.